joining us this afternoon for the fourth annual NLM Science, Technology, and Society Lecture. NLM's Office of Strategic Initiatives organized this annual lecture series to raise awareness around societal and ethical implications of conduct of biomedical research and the use of advanced technologies. It is our hope that these engaging lectures will fuel important conversations around NLM, NIH, and the broader biomedical research community. I'm pleased today to introduce our esteemed guest lecturer, Meredith Broussard. Ms. Broussard is an associate professor at New York University's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute, as well as the research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. She is the author of More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech, which came out last year, and the award-winning 2018 book, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. Ms. Broussard's research focuses on artificial intelligence and investigative reporting with a focus on AI ethics and using data analysis for social good. A former features editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, Ms. Broussard has also worked as a software developer at AT&T Bell Labs and the MIT Media Lab. Her feature stories and essays have appeared in media outlets including the New York Times, The Atlantic, Slate, and Vox. Today's lecture, which shares the tagline of Ms. Broussard's most recent book, will help us think through concrete strategies to detect and mitigate bias in our approach to developing artificial intelligence technologies. Her insights into promoting ethical and responsible development and use of AI technologies comes to us at a critical point. In the last two years, discussions around trustworthy AI have really taken off. We now have powerful guiding documents, such as the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, which is from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, released in uh, October 2022, and the AI Risk Management Framework, published by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, or NIST, last year. We also have very clear directives on advancing a comprehensive whole-of-government strategy for responsible innovation including through an, exec an executive order on the safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of artificial intelligence. This was signed by the president on October 2030th, on October 30th of 2023. These government-wide efforts are dedicated to unlocking the potential of artificial intelligence to solve some of our most pressing challenges and accelerating scientific discovery while protecting against the technology's potential risks. At NIH, that means working to mitigate bias, preserve privacy, and promote ethical approaches to integrating AI and biomedical and health research. This will serve to advance equitable health outcomes for communities across the nation. As the world's largest biomedical research library, with a commitment to preserving and protecting the public trust, NLM plays an important role in realizing this goal and affirming this commitment. We house and make accessible valuable data resources. These can be harnessed to drive discovery. We are a leader in health data standards development that enables the discovery, interoperability, and the reusability of our data resources. And we're a driver of data science and AI research through both our extramural and intramural research programs. With this framing in mind, I am looking forward to hearing her walk us through examples of the potential consequences of developing algorithms without careful consideration of potential biases, even when these technologies are developed with the best intentions. And I'm also eager to hear her insights on practical solutions to detect when technology reinforces inequality and learn more about her ideas for designing better systems for a more equitable outcome. This lecture will be followed by a question and answer portion. So if you have any questions for Ms. Bessard, you can make your way to a microphone that will be provided if you're with us here in person. And if you're joining with us online, you can use the Ask a Question feature found under the lecture description on videocast. Please welcome me now in joining Ms. Broussard. Hi, everybody. It is so great to be here with you today. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about some ideas from my most recent book, More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech. Uh, you are actually one of the kickoff stops on my paperback tour uh, because the paperback is just releasing. So thank you for that. Uh, and specifically, I want to talk uh, a little bit about cancer. Uh, and I want to talk about 
uh, how looking at uh, cancer can help us understand algorithmic bias. And I'm gonna do that by telling you a story about cancer. Uh, but first, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about artificial intelligence, uh, something that I think is really important to emphasize when we're talking about AI with the general public is we need to emphasize that AI is not magic and that it is not Hollywood visions, okay? Because everybody you talk to, uh, well, every, every non-AI scientist is like, think, well, actually, everybody you talk to is thinking about the Terminator. Uh, or they're thinking about Star Wars or Star Trek or Ex Machina or her or, you know, even Big Hero 6. Like, they're thinking about all of the cool Hollywood portrayals of AI. And this happens because of a specific way that our brains work. Our brains are better at recalling stories than they are at recalling facts and statistics. So we always go to Hollywood first. And Hollywood tells amazing stories. So the Terminator is stuck in our brains. I will admit to having spent a lot of time thinking about the Terminator myself, I, but it's not real. So we need to emphasize when we're talking about AI to the general public that I, there's lots of stuff, uh, stuff about AI that's imaginary. And what's real about AI is that it's math. It's very complicated, beautiful math. Uh, and math is really great, but it is not going to rise up and take over. There's a lot of anxiety about AI takeovers and robot apocalypses out there. Uh, and I like to just get that out of the way um, because it allows us to uh, have deeper conversations about artificial intelligence, which I think is really important in this space. And specifically, the conversation that I'm really interested in having is about bias in AI and the way that AI discriminates. Uh, so I really like an idea that comes from Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology, which is the idea that AI systems, automated systems, discriminate by default. So for a very long time, there's been this idea that I call techno-chauvinism, the idea that technological solutions are superior to others. Instead, what I would argue is that we should think about using the right tool for the task. Because sometimes the right tool for the task is undoubtedly a computer. Sometimes it's something simple like a book in the hands of a child sitting on a parent's lap. You know, one is not inherently better than the other, right? But the techno-chauvinist perspective perspective tells us that AI uh, or computational solutions are objective or unbiased or superior. But we can push back at that. We can let it go. And then certain things become clear. It becomes clear that the problems of the past are reflected in the data that we use to train AI systems. So when we make a machine learning system, what we do is we take a whole bunch of data, usually straight from the internet, we dump it in the computer, we say, computer, make a model. Computer makes a model. The model shows the mathematical patterns of the data. And then what we can do is all kinds of cool stuff. We can use that model to make predictions or decisions or to generate new text or images or audio or video or what have you, right? Uh, but the problems of the past are things like discrimination, uh, racism, sex, sexism, ableism, structural inequality, uh, which unfortunately uh, all occur in the world. We do not live in a perfect world. And all of these patterns of discrimination are reflected in the data we use to train AI systems. So how does this manifest? Well, I have a couple of examples. One comes from the markup, which is really terrific. Uh, algorithmic accountability news organization. Highly recommend reading them if you're not reading them already. Uh, the markup did an investigation a few years ago about the secret bias hidden in mortgage approval algorithms. What they found was that automated mortgage approval algorithms were 40 to 80% more likely to deny borrowers of color than they were their white counterparts. And then in some metro areas, this disparity is more than 2 or 3 to 4. Now, a data scientist might look at this and say, well, it's just what's in the data. You know, what's problematic about this? And a sociologist might look at it and say, all right, well, clearly what's happening is the mortgage approval algorithms are being fed with data about who got mortgages in the past. And the U.S. has a very long history of residential segregation, has a long history of financial discrimination in lending. And so the algorithms are picking up on those patterns of discrimination and reproducing them, right? So it's a good example of how 
discrimination happens by default inside the automated systems. Now we could mathematically put a finger on the scale. We could evaluate our algorithms and say, okay, how many uh, loans are going to uh, people of different categories slash protected classes? And if it's not a sufficient percentage, we can change the algorithm so that it gives more loans to people from those protected categories. Is that actually happening? Eh, not, not quite so much. Um, another example of discrimination happens in facial recognition. Uh, you're probably familiar with the Gender Shades Project, uh, where the investigators looked at facial recognition systems and found that uh, the major facial recognition systems uh, work better on men than on women. They work better on people with light skin than people with dark skin. Uh, trans and non-binary folks are generally not represented uh, in these data sets at all. And when you do an intersectional analysis, uh, the systems work best of all on men with light skin and work worst of all on women with dark skin. But, uh, and so this is absolutely a problem that could be addressed with the training data, right? The data scientist's first question is usually, well, can't you just make the training data more diverse? And absolutely, yes, that would make these systems more accurate. But one thing we can do is we can push further and look at the uses of facial recognition. We can look at AI in context. And we can say, well, we need to think about uh, things like facial recognition used in policing, because facial recognition used to unlock your phone is probably a low risk use, right? It doesn't work for me most of the time, but I don't really care. I just use my passcode. Uh, but facial recognition used by police on real-time video feeds, video surveillance feeds, uh, is going to be a high-risk use because it's going to misidentify women and people of color more often and uh, get people caught up in the criminal justice system uh, who don't need to be caught up in the criminal justice system. That's a high-risk use, and that might need to be regulated. Right, so we need to think, oh, sure. All right, is that better? Okay, all right. Sorry, online folks. Uh, all right, so let's not use facial recognition in policing. Uh, so that is the prefatory material about AI, but let's talk about cancer, because I have an AI story I wanna get off my chest. Uh, and it is about the time that I got breast cancer. Uh, so it was the beginning of the pandemic, and I, I got the news that you never want to get, uh, and I had breast cancer. Uh, it was really hard. Uh, I'm fine now. I'm really grateful to the uh, doctors and the medical professionals who took care of me. Uh, and I learned a whole bunch of things along the way that I think are uh, are useful to talk about when we talk about what the general public understands about AI and how we can talk about AI and medicine with the general public. So one of the things that I did uh, when I first got diagnosed is uh, I freaked out because uh, everybody freaks out when they first get diagnosed and the way that you freak out tends to be consistent with your personality. So my freak out involved obsessively reading everything. I possibly could. Everything I could find on the internet, I spent so much time on PubMed, and I also read every single thing in every single drop down in every single part of my electronic medical record, which is where I stumbled across a mention that I, this scan was read by Dr. So-and-so and also by an AI. And I thought, why is this AI reading my scan? What did it find? Who wrote this AI? What kind of bias is in it? And I had a little moment and then I forgot about it because, you know, cancer. Uh, and then I came back to it a little while later, you know, a year or so later. Uh, I was feeling better. It was COVID. Uh, and I decided to uh, get a little bit carried away. Uh, I decided that I was going to do an experiment. I was going to... Uh, download my own scans uh, and run them through an open source 
AI in order to write about the state of the art in AI-based cancer detection. Uh, and I, I will admit that I got a little carried away. This was maybe a little extreme, but I, I was trying to reproduce uh, the experiment. I have always been really interested in reproducibility. Uh, and of course, the idea in reproducibility is that you would publish your code and data online, and then other people can reproduce your experiment and validate it. We do this a lot in journalism when we publish the code that we and the data that we use in order to do a particular analysis, um, especially in algorithmic accountability reporting. And so uh, I took my scans uh, and I ran them through an AI. Uh, I had a lot of misconceptions, it turned out. Uh, and my misconceptions about how AI would be used in, uh, in cancer detection uh, are not uncommon. So here I have a picture of a, uh, you know, a, somebody's mammogram, right? Some mammogram that I found on the internet, not my actual mammogram. Um, and I thought that I was going to take my entire electronic medical record feed it in, and I was going to put in all of my scans and, you know, the 3D video, uh, blah, 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 and it was going to evaluate everything and then, like, pop out an answer. Like, we think you have cancer. But, no, this is totally wrong. I, I also thought that I was going to do an experiment where I would change my race and see if the prediction changed. And... This was a good premise for an experiment, but also totally wrong because there's no race in the AI that I use. So I, one of my misconceptions was that it was going to look at my entire record. No, the way that, I, that most I, cancer detection AI that we have right now works is I, that you put in a, a flat image, and what it will do is it will identify an area of concern on the image. Uh, so I was a little surprised to hear this, um, but I, you know, downloaded the stuff. I got the, uh, I got all the code working. I fed in uh, my images and I got nothing. I was like, you know, I, I know there's cancer here. Like my doctor has seen it. Like I got a mastectomy because there was cancer here. Why can't the, the AI see it? Uh, then it turned out that I, my image resolution was totally wrong, and I had to go through this whole rigmarole of uh, trying to get access to high-resolution versions of my scans. Uh, after a month or two of wrangling, I finally gave up and uh, asked them to send me a CD in the mail, and then I had to buy a CD reader. In order to open up these files, I was like, what is this? You know, 2007, I don't know. Uh, so, at any rate, I got it going. Uh, and eventually, it did identify an area of concern. This is what an area of concern might look like. Again, this is some image I got off the internet. Um, and what I found was that I got a score of, uh, or it gave me, it identified an area of concern, and it gave me a score. And I was really surprised that it didn't, like, kind of give me a big, uh, like, a big rigmarole. You know how when you text somebody congratulations, like, it gives you balloons and stuff? Like, I guess I was sort of expecting that, but, like, you don't want to have cancer. Or you have cancer. But that's not actually how it works. Um so that was one of the things that I learned along the way, uh, that uh, even when you are a researcher who works on people's unrealistic expectations around AI, you actually yourself have unrealistic expectations around AI. And it's useful to keep this in mind when we're communicating with the public about what AI does and doesn't. Uh, one of the things that I was obsessed with was how likely am I to die from this, right? Because that is the big question that you have when you are diagnosed with cancer. Um, I don't know what cancer researchers 
big questions are. All I know is from the perspective of somebody diagnosed. Uh, and what I knew was that black women uh, are 40% more likely to die from breast cancer. But I, I am, I, my mom was black, my, my dad was black, my mom was white, and uh, my mom died of breast cancer when, I, when she was 50. And I wondered, okay, for the purposes of medical statistics, would I be considered black? Would I be considered white? What is my risk profile? And I asked my doctor about this, and my doctor explained that, I, well, actually, what we do when there are differences in, uh, in patterns uh, or prevalence by race is for you, we run your numbers both ways as if you were black and if, as if you were white. And then we just assume that your actual number is somewhere in between. I was like, that's science? So I couldn't figure out, okay, am I likely to die from this? Am I not likely to die from this? And it made me think, okay, there's a lot of ambiguity in diagnosis. There's a lot of ambiguity in statistics, and we're not necessarily paying enough attention to that ambiguity when we are encoding these systems in, uh, in algorithms, right? So we need to talk more about the ambiguity. Uh, I also thought it was significant that computers don't diagnose the same way that doctors do, right? The computer identifies an area of concern and gives you a score. This particular one gave me a score between zero and one. I thought this maybe meant that you have a 20% chance of having cancer in this area. But no, the researcher told me that uh, it's absolutely empirically not a prediction. It is just a score. Turns out this is because of the legal landscape, uh, because I, you know, there's you know, heavily regulated industry and uh, he could get in big trouble for uh, for saying there's 20% chance. So it's just like, oh yeah, this, this is a 0.2 score. I'm like, all right, fine. Uh, another thing that people usually don't realize, that the general public generally does not realize about AI that's important to say in the context of cancer is uh, that these systems are tuned to either give you a higher rate of false positives or higher rate of false negatives. So a false positive would be where it says, yep, probably have cancer, and you don't have cancer. And false negative is where it says, nope, no cancer, and you do actually have cancer. So in medicine, of course, it's considered uh, kind of higher stakes uh, to have more false negatives than false positives. You know, we, we are all united in wanting to save more lives uh, for more people to be uh, diagnosed and treated effectively. So there is consensus uh, appropriately that these systems should be tuned to have higher rates of false positives than false negatives. But it's kind of a strange thing to realize you have to decide how wrong you want your diagnostic system to be. And people are pretty uncomfortable with that. I also uh, got really interested in racial disparities uh, in diagnosis and then also in uh, AI read scans. Uh, there was this really interesting study uh, that looked at machine learning models uh, diagnosing, I think it was uh, pleural effusion. Uh, I could be, you, you can back check me on this one. Um, at any rate, they uh, were looking at these models that were extremely effective on data from one hospital, and then they added in another hospital, and it was really effective on the data from this next hospital. And then they added in the data on the patient's race. And it turned out that these models... Recording were... in progress. Oh. <laughs> these models were differentially accurate Based on race, right? But it's just scans of people's insides. And the research were like, why is this happening? And nobody's been able to explain why this is happening. Right? It's a really big unknown, right? We know that things like facial recognition systems are differentially accurate, 
right, based on uh, based on skin tone, but it doesn't make any sense to a human, or at least to this human, that the scan of the inside would be different based on what? This is what the results show. So big question mark. And one of the things that I find really interesting is the way that race gets encoded in medical systems uh, and in algorithms as if it were real. So race is social, it's not biological, right? There are genetic differences between people, right? But race does not describe those genetic differences. So race is a social construct, it's not a biological reality, but it sometimes gets embedded in algorithms and in medical systems as if it were a biological reality. So you're all probably familiar with race correction, right? Uh, so in uh, kidney, uh, kidney disease diagnosis, um, there's a pretty famous example of EGFR, estimated glomerular, the glomerular filtration rate. So when your uh, EGFR gets down to about 20, about 20% kidney function, you're eligible for the kidney transplant list. Uh, and that doesn't mean you'll get the kidney, it means you're eligible to start waiting for a kidney that matches. It might take years. Uh, and for a very long time, there was a race correction built in so that uh, if you were black, you got a multiplier applied in your EGFR calculation, which meant that black patients had to be sicker than any other patients in order to qualify for the kidney transplant list. Right. We also see race corrections in things like uh, concussion, uh, concussion calculations. There was a, uh, a case uh, in the NFL where the NFL made this multi-billion dollar settlement to players who had uh, experienced multiple concussions and had really traumatic brain injuries and long-term effects. And uh, they used a calculation to figure out how much each player was owed and black players were given a race correction under the assumption that uh, their mental capacity was diminished relative to other players and they were owed less money. Right? They fought it, they won. Uh, but we do see things like race correction lingering. And so this lingered in the kidney, uh, kidney algorithm uh, until very recently. Uh, actually until uh, copy edits for my book were due. So I was pretty glad that it changed. Uh, and I was also glad it changed in time to get into my book. Uh, so uh, the kidney algorithm has changed. EGFR no longer includes a race correction. Uh, but we do have to think about every single lab that used these different numbers, right? So every single lab would take your race on your patient chart and would calculate it as either black or white. Uh, and I discovered the other day that my lab was actually still calculating it. It's just that the, uh, the number got mushed. And by the time I saw it in my electronic medical record, it had been, you know, the two numbers had been squished together or something. So we have to think about these socio-technical systems. We have to think about the data pipelines. And when we make changes, like we change the formula to eliminate the race correction variable, we do have to think about the pipelines and think about it's really complicated to change these things. We can also think about what are the implications of our AI models, right? So if the AI model is being trained with some kind of discriminatory assumption inside it, and then you realize it, well, then you have to go and you have to retrain the model and you have to change the whole pipeline. And it's actually an extremely, extremely complicated and resource intensive uh, effort. Uh, we should be doing it, uh, but it's way more complicated than anybody imagines because we generally think about computational solutions as being fast, cheap, efficient, and they're uh, not all of these things at the same time. Uh, LLMs uh, are uh, on everybody's mind, and unfortunately, LLMs have the same kinds of problems uh, when it comes to 
uh, race-based medicine. Uh, they have the biases that we talked about before. Uh, so LLMs are pretty bad at math. So no, they're not, uh, they're not calculating anybody's EGFR score, uh, but they are doing things like uh, propagating uh, race-based medicine that is harmful, that is, uh, that is racist, that is problematic, uh, in part because these LLMs, large language models, generative AI systems, do not, uh, they're not parsing for content. They're basically language calculators. They're giving us strings of text. They're predicting strings of text based on strings of text they've seen in the past. And uh, racism is, uh, is not good, but unfortunately it is popular. And uh, popular is used as a proxy for good inside large algorithmic systems inside recommendation engines. And overall, race in machine learning is a little bit of a mess. Uh, so, as I said before, race is often embedded in uh, these computational systems as it, well, race is embedded in medical systems as if it were biological reality sometimes, and it is absolutely embedded in ML systems, in machine learning systems, as if it were a biological and social reality. So we need to do more reflecting on the social underpinnings of systems before we go uh, making algorithmic systems and fossilizing these discriminatory decisions in code. Now, one of the things that people often say is that the AI will get better eventually, right? I talk about the facial recognition systems that misidentify uh, women and people of color, and they're like, well, you know, can't you just make it better? And I talk about the mortgage approval systems, and they're like, well, can't you just uh, do this? And I talk about the race correction, they're like, well, can't you just do this? And I'm like, yeah. Like, okay, I hear you that like things improve, but I'm not convinced that that rosy, technological, seamless future is right around the corner. Because I've heard too many times that, oh yeah, in five years, it's going to be you know, all the problems are going to be fixed. And one of the things I've, I, I've been wondering about is whether all of the problems that are easy to solve with computers have been solved. And we're just left with the really complicated socio-technical problems. And a lot of social problems haven't been fixed in thousands of years. So I'm not sure why we expect that we're gonna be able to build machines to fix them in just a couple of months for, you know, just a couple million dollars. Uh, and one example of this uh, comes from a new news organization that was started by Julia Anglin, uh, formerly of ProPublica and The Markup. Uh, Julia Anglin has a new organization called Proof, uh, and Proof Labs and I uh, Alondra Nelson's lab at the Institute for Advanced Study joined together to do something called the AI Democracy Project. Uh, and they just did this really spectacular benchmarking uh, study where they looked at uh, the five leading AI models and benchmarked them. They said, okay, inside this vertical, right, inside elections, uh, something that's incredibly relevant to, you know, U.S. democracy succeeding in elections, how much misinformation is really being generated by these models? Because one of the things we haven't had to date is we haven't had a benchmark for LLMs. We haven't been able to say, okay, uh, LLMs are, you know, generating useful content 10% of the time, 100% of the time. Like, we just don't know. All we have are these qualitative claims. So, uh, one of the things that was brilliant about this project is they said, okay, let's get quantitative. Let's test these systems. Uh, so they built this tool that looked at, uh, that hit the APIs of all five large, five of the biggest large language models simultaneously. 
And then uh, you could hit the API with the same prompt and then get back the responses from each of the models. And it was really cool seeing all the responses on one page because when you, when you go to the sites individually, you kind of get distracted by the whole user experience. But uh, having them all come onto the same page, it was really easy to see the differences between them. Uh, and you kind of got a sense of what was happening in each of the models. Uh, so the responses were evaluated by teams. The teams were made up of uh, journalists and election officials. So people who uh, have a little bit of subject matter expertise and you know a lot of general knowledge, and then also people with deep subject area knowledge. Uh, and what they found was that uh, about half of the model's answers were inaccurate when it came to uh, questions about US elections. Uh, they evaluated the answers on four dimensions. So uh, was it inaccurate? Was it harmful? Was it incomplete? Was it biased? Uh, I really like this, uh, this four dimensional approach because I, uh, just saying, oh, AI is good or oh, AI is bad is not really getting us very far anymore. I really like this approach of going at uh, AI in context in a particular topic area and evaluating it for the qualities that we care about. Uh, so I love this approach. This is a really new methodology. This just came out like two weeks ago. So I uh, highly recommend checking this out. Uh, in general, though, uh, things I recommend are uh, looking for human problems inside AI systems. So for AI has a lot of boosters. Uh, you, you don't need me to stand up here and talk about how awesome AI is. Like You've had a lot of people telling you how awesome AI is, and it does a lot of really cool stuff. Like we can, we can definitely take that for granted. Um, but I, I am here to say, hey, let's also look for the human problems because nothing is, nothing is perfect. Uh, collaboration is key in this regard. Uh, so uh, collaborations uh, with humanists and social scientists and technologists and biomedical researchers. Uh, we can test our technology for accessibility. We can engage in algorithmic auditing. So benchmarking is a kind of algorithmic auditing. Uh, when we audit, we open up the black box of an algorithm. Uh, we explain what is happening inside. Uh, and we allow people some insights uh, and thus empower them. Uh, and overall, I think that uh, there's, there's a lot of discourse about AI being transformative and good for general purposes. I think it's actually safer to think about AI as being good for limited, low stakes, mundane tasks, not for high stakes tasks and not for general purpose use, right? So uh, helping at certain phases of the diagnostic process, not replacing a doctor. Uh, I also like to end with a bunch of resources for learning more. Uh, some of my favorites right now, uh, when uh, favorites in order to learn more about racial disparities in medicine, uh, Dr. Uche Blackstock has a new book out called Legacy, A Black Physician Reckons with Racism in Medicine. Uh, it's really fantastic. And she also has a uh, consulting agency called Health Equity Partners. Uh, on social media, uh, there's a medical student, Joel Burvell. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen him come across your feed. Uh, he does uh, really delightful, accessible work. Um, you can learn from journalists who are on the algorithmic accountability beat. Uh, so traditionally, one of the functions of the media has been to hold power accountable. In a world where algorithms are increasingly being used to make decisions on our behalf, that accountability function has to transfer onto algorithms and onto their makers. So algorithmic accountability is a beat. I mentioned the markup already. ProPublica, ICIJ, and the New York Times are also doing really good work in this regard. Um, algorithmic accountability, I should say, is uh, expensive and time consuming and requires a lot of people to do well. So if you're wondering why there's not more of it happening and why people are not doing algorithmic auditing of social media platforms, 
Well, it's because it's extremely expensive and time consuming and complicated and the tech companies are deliberately trying to uh, keep people from having access to the data. Um, we heard earlier about some of the uh, government resources around uh, responsible AI. Uh, so really like the uh, risk management framework out of NIST. I also really liked something called the Algorithmic Transparency Playbook from my colleagues at the Responsible uh, Center for Responsible AI at NYU. Uh, and then Data and Society and Equal AI are also doing some good stuff around algorithmic impact assessment tooling. Uh, so in the same way that we would do an environmental impact assessment when we build a new building, uh, we can do an algorithmic impact assessment in order to look at uh, how well or how badly an algorithm or algorithmic system is affecting a community. Uh, if you like more than a glitch or you like artificial unintelligence, uh, here are a handful of other things that you might want to uh, read or watch. Uh, and of course, there's two pages of syllabus because, you know, I'm a professor, I can't help myself. Uh, and with that, I'm going to thank you very much and say we have time for some questions. All right. Thank you so much. Um, this was a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal lecture, and I know something that we will be discussing quite a bit as um, an NLM community and with our colleagues across NIH, the government, and beyond. Um, so my name is Miriam Zeringham. I am the Data Science and Open Science Officer in the Office of Strategic Initiatives. I'll be moderate, moderating the Q&A. For those of you who are joining us um, remotely, uh, you can use the live feedback button that is under your videocast link to ask your questions. I have them coming up here on my computer. Um, if you are in the room, you are welcome to head to this microphone um, to ask your questions as well. Uh, I will kick us off. Um, so mine is a sort of long question, so I, I wrote it down. Um, but you started off your, your talk by telling us that uh, brains are better at recalling stories than they are facts and physics. And what has struck me both in your work and uh, over the course of the craft of this lecture that you have just given us is that you are both a storyteller of not only what can go wrong and, and why it matters, but also the how. How do things go wrong uh, and what can we do about it from that sort of deep technical practitioner expertise that you have? And this to me seems like a really important part of sort of getting into that black box and bringing more people who may not be coders themselves, but uh, have real sort of stakes and, and interest and there are real implications for their lives into that process to sort of co-create solutions and be a part of that discussion. So I'm wondering, you know, how is it that you have, um, this is kind of a craft question rather than a technical one, but how is it that you have sort of honed your craft? And what are some of the sort of, if you have any anecdotes about interesting conversations or paths that that has led you down? Um, I'm really curious to hear. That's a really great question. Thank you. Um, and it is, in fact, one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, so one of the things that I do in the uh, in the writing process is I uh, I like to try and explain myself to kids. Um, my son, for a really long time, was I uh, was a very good reader of my work. Um, actually, he still reads my work. It's just that he's older now. So I, uh, you know, it's different having an eleven year old read your work versus you know uh, an older teen. Um, and I got this idea from Jay Hamilton, who wrote this fantastic book, uh, Democracy's Detectives. Um, he hires teenagers from his uh, from his Quaker meeting in order to be his first readers, uh, because you know if you can, like, teenagers will tell you uh, what is confusing and what is boring. Like they just they don't have filters. So 
Uh, that's really helpful. Uh, I also try and think about um, how I would explain something in an interesting way at a cocktail party, um, because I have bored a lot of people at cocktail parties over the years, and I try not to do it, but uh, that's actually a really good way of, uh, of gauging how interesting something is. So in user interface design, uh, people talk about hallway user testing, which is where you go out in the hallway and you find somebody and you're like, hey, look at this, user test it on them. So I do the same thing with my writing. Like I go to parties and I tell stories and if it hits, I'm like, all right, like this is gonna be interesting enough to write about. And if it doesn't, I'm like, all right, I just bored somebody else. And you know, the stakes are very low. Um, Great, thank you. We have a question from the audience, the live audience. All right. Um, well, thanks again, uh, Ms. Smith. It's hard. Uh, Steve Sherry, I'm acting director of the library. Um, your remarks around harm and accountability uh, really resonate with me and the um, role of NLM in, in institutions trying to produce public goods and presenting preventing harm. So my questions are kind of we've got three tied together. First, in your example about the four dimensional assessment of the information risks in the election results. You mentioned harm as the second dimension. What is the harm that you're scoring on with election information? Is it personal harm? I'm just curious kind of what, what harm is in that context. The second question is about accountability, algorithmic accountability, and is there a best practice? Well, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna forget to... if you give me all okay. three at once. So let me do one at a time. Okay, I do want to get to all of them. Yep. Uh, so harm around elections. One of the things that was really smart about how this experiment was constructed is that it was not about all AI everywhere throughout time on every subject. It was U.S. presidential election 2024. And it was people who are working in election administration, the local election state level election administration. Uh, and the prompts were things like, where can I vote uh, in Nevada? Uh, and there are all these different local rules about, you know, same day registration. Uh, you know, if you need ID, what kind of ID you need? Uh, can you vote by text? Like the uh, the LLMs will tell you that you can vote via tax. Like you cannot okay. vote via tax. Like so, I uh, one of the things that happened at the testing event is we talked about okay, what are the potential harms that could result from this particular answer to this particular question, right? So I I do not have the uh, so there's a get the data link here. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can dig into the uh, the prompts and the responses, and they've probably published the ratings too. Um, so you'd be able to see, okay, which ones were rated harmful by the specific people in the room around the specific topic. So, so, so in a general sense, I'm sensing then the, the harm is disenfranchisement to exercise your right to vote correctly. It's not harm in an injurious sense. It's it's a civil arm. Yes. Okay. That yeah. kind of, is, yeah. that, that makes sense. Um, and I think the other interesting thing that I think is really important is that uh, this is an experiment that gets us more, that gets us closer to evaluating AI in context, right? So for a very long time, uh, or you know, computing in general is about write once, run anywhere. And we try to make these generalizable systems and this comes from the intellectual heritage of mathematics, where in math, you're trying to derive theorems that are going to work everywhere, right? Like the Pythagorean theorem never stops being true. That's amazing. Uh, but that's the, like, that's the pursuit of mathematics is universal truths. Well, AI is math, but AI systems can't make universal truths when it comes to something like language or election information or, you know, medical diagnosis. Like, it's just not possible because there's so much variation in the world. Um, you know, so like I'm much more excited about using AI for like 
research into protein folding than I am about using AI for diagnosing common skin conditions. So this is a perfect intro to my second question, which is algorithmic accountability or algorithmic mm -hmm. auditing. You had a term for that, yep. something that's done. And is that something, because of this conditional context where algorithms operate, is there a burden on algorithm creators to do that auditing themselves or offer up some measure of performance, yep. like the receiver operator curve you showed, right? Where did you make those choices? And is that kind of disclosure um, recommended? And in, in if so, kind of in what standards or practices? Because I'm not familiar with it in NIST. They just challenge you to make your own mm -hmm. assessments. But maybe FDA does. And medical device, there might be something more objective. I don't know. No, there definitely isn't. Uh, there isn't any. There are... The standards are evolving as we speak. Uh, so I just saw something uh, on social media today uh, about a new paper by Deborah Raji, uh, who's an expert in algorithmic auditing. Uh, she and her collaborators have a new paper out about gaps in uh, gaps in tooling in algorithmic auditing. Uh, so it's a really new field. And so we are developing standards. Uh, one of the things that I did for the book was I, I, I sometimes write software in order to kind of answer a journalistic question or like demonstrate something about uh, the process of making software. And one of the things that I, uh, that I made over the course of writing the book was I made a platform for algorithmic auditing. Um, so if you're familiar with Kathy O'Neill's book, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction, uh, it was one of the books that kicked off the kind of entire algorithmic accountability conversation. Uh, Kathy has uh, an algorithmic auditing consulting firm called Orca. Uh, and so I collaborated with Orca to build a platform for algorithmic auditing where you could uh, feed in, uh, you know, feed in data and uh, like basically it would get evaluated and then we would give you a little report about, you know, potential biases. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that we do need. Uh, it exists in various forms, but you can't uh, right now just go and buy something off the shelf. It's mostly bespoke, and there are a bunch of open source solutions out there, um, but it's still it's still at the level of being bespoke and. We do need to get it to a level of platforms at some point, but we're not there yet. That was going to be my last question on that topic, which is NIH is very interested in social determinants of health, right? And as we look at equity and all of the environmental and historical contexts that create racial bias in medicine, is there a place to consider these algorithms as another social determinant in that spectrum of external factors to health? It's like you're saying, it's becoming an emergent embedded property in healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. So do we need to pay attention to the library to trying to identify and, and organize information around algorithms and their biases? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Uh, there is, uh, so uh, Emma Pearson, who's one of the authors on this paper, uh, is doing some interesting work at Cornell. Um, I also uh, always recommend uh, reading uh, Roxana, I'm going to mess up their name, Dan Dana Show, um, who's doing really interesting work in uh, dermatology uh, and, uh, and ML stuff. Uh, so I think for me, it's about keeping track of who is doing interesting work and, uh, and kind of keeping up with the latest thinking because I think the way that we that we think about these issues is going to change, right? Uh, I mean, if we even think about something like uh, in pediatrics, uh, one of the big initiatives a few years ago was, oh, let's get baby or let's get little kids' uh, dental health evaluated because it was, you know, they realized that okay, like if kids go to the dentist, that's actually like an indicator that they're being well looked after medically overall. And so it wasn't really about the dentist per se. It was about the dentist as being a signifier of, of wellness. And so how do you, like, how do you highlight that? And how do you 
like as algorithms find things like, okay, you know, if a child has three cavities before age four, then, you know, they might need some nutritional counseling. Like, how do you approach that from a library perspective? I think we're still trying to figure it out. Great. Uh, so we'll take a question from online, and then it looks like we have a question from in the room. Um, so one uh, virtual attendee noted that many of the discussions that they've heard around diversity um, and AI have focused on race, gender, and national origin with not as much discussion of communities with disabilities. I know that this has been a focus of your research for more than a glitch. Um, so was wondering if you could comment on some of your learnings in this space, um, perhaps a story about success around co-creation. And I've also heard you um, talk about um, curb Oh curb cuts. Curb cuts, yes. yes. Um, so wanted to give you an opportunity to talk sure. about some of that work. Um, you know what? Let me talk about disability dongles. Like, I think those are, those are really interesting. So uh, first of all, so More Than a Glitch is about confronting race, gender, and ability bias in tech. Uh, and originally, it was just about race and gender. And I was like, wait a minute. There's not enough discourse about disability. Uh, and then I started writing, and I was like, oh, wait. I need to learn. So that was the topic that I had to learn the most about in order to write this book. So I'm really grateful to uh, the folks who took the time to explain things to me and the uh, thinkers and creators who I had an opportunity to learn from. Uh, and something that was, uh, that was really powerful to me was the concept of a disability dongle. So this is uh, something that a designer will create because they think that it's going to be uh, transformative for people with disabilities. Uh, so a really good example of that is the stair climbing wheelchair, right? Like tons and tons of these things have been developed. They all have these like kind of wacky looking architectures. Like, you know, they're not wheels, they're like crosses. So you can climb up the stairs with little caterpillar wheels on them. And uh, when you uh, when you ask somebody in a wheelchair, like, oh, do you, do you want the stair climbing wheelchair? Like, look, I invented this wheelchair, it climbs stairs. They're like, no, I don't want that. That looks terrifying. Uh, I just want to ramp. Like, I have a wheelchair. I want to ramp. And you realize, like, oh, wait, you don't need to over-engineer this solution. And also, like, you should have just asked the person using the wheelchair, like, listen, what's going to make your life easier? Instead of assuming that this thing that you came up with is going to uh, is going to help right so I uh, the idea is that when we're designing technologies we need to consult with affected communities and build out of the needs of the affected communities as opposed to this kind of top-down Silicon Valley approach of oh I am the designer I know everything I'm going to create this for you Thanks so much. I know we're at time. Um, but so my name's Haley. I'm a postdoc here. I do something called metabolomics research, which is where we take a lot of different chemicals and try to find out how they contribute to a disease. And what's neat about it is that we're looking at a lot of different variables and trying to like find more granularity um, beyond what we already know. And I saw that reflected here, especially when thinking about stuff like race, like you said, like it can be overly broad or with disabilities or maybe stuff that we don't understand. Um, and also, so actually to take it to the bigger picture, I was noticing a pattern in your talk in that what we need to evaluate are our inputs and our outputs and how we um, interpret our data. And I think you gave two really good examples, but they introduced questions for me because even when we were talking about that, um, the four-dimensional evaluation of AI, the question that it brought up to me is like, well, these are still, so humans create the AI. Humans are also evaluating the AI. It made me wonder what would, how would the outputs change if there were different people doing the evaluation? How would the output change if instead of reporting it on a majority vote, we used a different kind of metric? Mm -hmm. And so like, these are all the questions that I'm wondering is, does, is that what goes into your algorithmic accountability tool? And, it seems like you're proposing a human solution to a machine problem, which I think is absolutely appropriate. Because like you said, like computers are only going to address so many problems. So 
is it appropriate for these tools to continue being computers? And also, there are a lot of elements to this question because I'm thinking both about the inputs and the outputs at the same time. So two parts then. One part related to the race or other variables that are maybe too large to account for. What have you seen um, that maybe has been highlighted or something that could be effective for breaking these down into more granular chunks, kind of like what we do with metabolomics to try to understand more granular, granular chemistry? And also, when it comes to the outputs, and you're evaluating these things, what are the kinds of reproducible questions that we can ask about how the data is being interpreted? Like, for example, a lot of them can be like, who is in the room? Because like, that was the first question that came up mm -hmm. for me with the, the AI evaluation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think you basically just encapsulated my entire talk in one question. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say that the thing that helps me is something from science and something from literature. So from literature, uh, I think a lot about hubris, right? Uh, in you know, I took a lot of Shakespeare classes in college, and you know, you what you learn from Shakespeare is don't like get too far out over your own skis, right? Or you're going to get knocked down. So I try not to have hubris. I try not to solve all of the problems of the universe with one algorithm. And so that I think is a really important approach because one of the things we see coming out of Silicon Valley is, oh, this AI is going to solve everything. It's going to be useful for all general purposes. And like, mm, maybe it's not. Um, so, and then the other thing is uh, I try and approach uh, algorithmic questions more like a scientist than like a computer scientist. So I like to uh, to take a really small piece. I like to get really granular and look at a really finite case in order to illuminate the larger universe as opposed to trying to write about everything mm -hmm. throughout time. Um, because that's how scientific knowledge evolves, right? And so I think that's how our knowledge in algorithmic spaces needs to evolve too. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been really wonderful. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you so much. A lot of uh, comments coming in to just thanking you for a great, great talk. So uh, please, one more round of, of applause. Thank you so much.